Welcome. This is the January 25th Beehive Production Users Call, and we have Rod, Dan, L, Evo, Jan, and myself, Michael, and let me make that into call. And uh, we have a carryover topic from the last meeting. We were exploring the idea of a ZFS empty or delete command that would be equivalent to rolling back a snapshot to an empty initial snapshot. And the goal would be to one, save a bunch of time deleting a lot of data and two, preserve all the properties within that data set uh, because it may have been well-crafted. And if you're going to destroy it, one, that'll be slow too, you'll lose those properties. So we're brainstorming if uh, we should have any special handling for child data sets, like keep them mounted while you cleanse the parent data set or don't support them at all, or simply require the user to remount them, which will recreate any directory mount points. So there's some text on screen. It's just a seed idea that we're all kicking around, but it's been helpful to vocalize it. So if anyone else has something to add to that, great. Uh, otherwise, there it is. There's the seed. Let's go from there. And let's see, we have Evo joining us for the first time. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael. So uh, yes, my name is Evo. I work as a DevOps contractor, basically. Um, I work with uh, the other two guys and we work for customers in Germany, Switzerland. Um, we are based a little bit all around the world. So two of us from Italy. Some other guy is uh, from Asia, so this is how we basically work. And yeah, it's since some, yeah, let's say two years nearly that I started to use FreeBSD as much as possible. Yeah. Um, before, of course, uh, I used uh, Linux, especially Debian, as much as possible. And... Uh, what we try to do today is to use FreeBSD as much as possible, especially when we have a customer situation, for example, where they run Kubernetes cluster, but for example, they need to run Postgres or MySQL databases, which we try to keep outside Kubernetes. And for this, FreeBSD is definitely the best choice. Just works. Updates are super smooth. And recently, uh, I started to relay more and more on ZFS uh, snapshotting, especially using Sunoid and Syncoid. And this is also where, yeah, when I started, so when I start to uh, look around for some new technologies, I usually go over to YouTube, try to find everything I can. And this is also where I found most of you guys doing some talks from the past. And uh, so uh, I wrote to Greg Wallace on LinkedIn uh, and told him, hey, look, uh, I would be interested into joining some calls or if there is something to do and try to meet the people. Because till now, I, I've never been inside the free BSD, the BSD community too much. Um, and this is, yes, my first start where I joined. And let's get this journey uh, up and running and see. So Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, sounds like you've come to the right place. And funny, we had uh, Jim Salter, the author of Sanoid Synchoid, on yesterday on the ZFS call. And so we had a That's lively easy. discussion. <laughs> yeah. It was his first call. So you, you missed him by like uh, almost 20 hours. Uh, that said, are you using Beehive in any of that? Uh, not yet, really. I tried it out. Um, what I do mostly so far is all the things that we can run outside of Linux. Um, we try to run them in in jails. So uh, I use Bastille for that. Um, it covers many, many, many aspects so far. Um, for the virtualization, we run Proxmox. Uh, because, uh, because, <laughs> yep. but um, okay. definitely Beehive is on the on the roadmap. So this is definitely something that we are going to take a look when time permits it. And uh, especially for, I, I, I saw in the read that the stability and it, it has much improved in the last year. So definitely it can be 
something that uh, looks definitely interesting. And sometimes we need a, a web UI, to be honest, for some developers or some not so experienced um, people. So this is a pro of Proxmox, mm, nowhere around it. But beside that, um, I think there is nothing that would block us to to use Beehive, especially an interesting thing would be to start to run um, K3S nodes on uh, on, uh, on Beehive. So this would also be an option. What was that last part? What was the last part there? Having notes or something? Sorry, I just had an interruption. Can you repeat? What What did you last say? Like, it would be nice to have notes or something? Uh, to run uh, K3S or Kubernetes nodes inside. Oh, notes. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so I know there, uh, John D, who's often on these calls, is perhaps doing that. And uh, if you if you catch the recent calls, Rod, who's on the call, has been dual booting Proxmox and FreeBSD at the UEFI level. So that's a fun one. And just uh, if you are just as a nice, fresh kind of guinea pig here, when you have a junior administrator needing to jump on a system, what would you say those key uh, minimum ability should be obviously there if it's a new user they don't need to go super deep into perhaps storage but what do you tasks do you think uh you would like to hand them in a safe manner with a nice gui start stop vms create vms yeah something like that definitely starting up the vms creating them um taking looks on the resources of course how the things are performing being able to snapshot them. Um, what would be also interesting is to move those VMs around if possible. So being able to move them from one node to another, especially in HA, high availability, critical situations. So this is definitely something that would be useful. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to corner you there, but uh, it's also good to have... Uh a fresh perspective because many of us are in the trenches and I can't see the forest from the trees at times. Um, ah, yes. And Rod commented, it's not quite dual booting what he's doing, uh, but he's, Oh, this is a good point. He's, he's booting multiple OSs off the same Z pool so using boot environments, which is sort of enlightened dual booting. Uh, so there's that. Okay. Well, thank you for that list. Uh, and thank you for your patience on me cornering you with it. And do, 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 Jan, you had a question there. I'm going to go through the chat here. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so that said, um, last Friday we had a four-hour hackathon. There was no recording, but uh, we had a great time. We debugged. We went through all so sorts of things, and I built a list of terrible puns that could go on t-shirts that are at the top of the list of the document there. So I will drop the document in chat. Welcome on Trinig. Let's see. Uh, I'll throw him on the attendance here. Just one sec. Okay. Welcome on Trinig. We have someone new, Evo, who Chris, uh, no, uh, Greg kindly, uh, relayed to us uh going down that list as part of the hackathon i smoke tested a whole bunch of os's that are listed there with success or failure but i found that omni os was one of the uh least prepared for beehive insofar as consoles may have needed issues whereas triblix and and smart os and open indiana all came up beautifully and quickly so uh i do know there is a lot of uh, Omni OS love within reach such that uh, if anyone's interested in pursuing that, I'm happy to help them and figure out what essentially regressed. Just saying. Looks like Chris hasn't rolled in. He's been working on VM State D, a C based uh, supervisor for Beehive. I don't think Chuck will be able to join us, but uh, let's see. Uh, Antrenig, it sounds like you've still been struggling with your large system. It is relatively well documented in the previous minutes. Uh, any news on that front? 
I am in here. I assume you can't hear me very well. Oh, you sound great. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, you know, a whole massive thing. Oh, so okay. doing the HBA migration right now. Uh, I'll let you know how it goes. And we have an OmniOS deployed as a DHCP DNS server. Uh, hopefully we'll be using Beehive on this OmniOS machine as well. Great. Good luck with the HBA. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be chatting. So. so, yeah, he's been struggling with storage issues at scale. It's got two, uh, two terabytes of RAM, and he found that Linux would not handle the HBA very well. So for their Linux-based applications, he essentially used this host as a wrapper using Beehive. So he has one massive VM and things like NFS have been a challenge installing out and uh, it shipped with a RAID card. And just today he got the new HBA. So hopefully that will take care of these issues that have been driving him crazy. Uh, just saying. So it's been a fun one. And uh, in the course of that, uh, it's not obvious how to trick modern QEMU into supporting more than a terabyte of guest RAM, whereas it just came up fine with Beehive. However, he found that, for example, with wired memory, he topped out at 1.7 terabytes. Is that right? Whereas he was trying to give it more. So he's exploring uncharted territory. And uh, I'm grateful for that because I don't have a system of that size. Yeah, as you recall, 1.5, but he's just futzing with that hardware. So there's that. Um, Evo, a, a, a perpetual topic is just what's a faster uh, networking infrastructure for virtual machines and to some degree jails. So we did cover NetGraph quite a bit on the hackathon document. Actually, let me show you all that if you've missed it. Uh, that's where... Daniel Bell kindly gave us some beautiful, there's a terrible slogans, but some beautiful net graph graphs and other tips. So these were real world uh, tips that he punched in there and then graphed them. So uh, if you know Luigi Rizzo, feel free to get him involved because we all have questions, many, many questions. He's at a university in Italy. Why do, you, why do you want to get Luigi involved? Well, he produced it, did he not? And no, Net Netcraft oh, came out one's... of Whistle Communications. That's uh, that was out of Whistle. Okay. Oh, something. Yeah, Net... Julian Elsher and and okay. um, Cobbs. Uh, Marco, you're confusing yep. Net Graph and Net Map yes, again. I am. I, totally I always will. Subsystems. Yeah. I always will. Guaranteed. It just ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just saying. Just saying. Uh, do we know if that has a live maintainer insofar as a company or individuals? If it was Julian back in the day? No, no, it's it's no. As far as I know, nobody is maintaining the NetGraph code. Wasn't there a, a Google Summer of Code this year for adding a better SMP support and trying to port it from a topology lock to Epoch? I believe that's true. It's one of the it's one of the remaining bad thorns in that graph is that it's a lot of it's single lock. Oh uh, well, or uh, it's a read write lock if I remember. So you basically lock the topology while anyone is um, processing packets, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. So at least it's not a pure mutex, but if I remember correctly. Still uh, porting it to Epoch and then uh, basically as a use style memory management would be a lot more for it. Cool. And a question from last week Does anyone have a clear require, uh, memory of Yakub's CBIOS work? I couldn't find any links to it related to. Uh, FreeNAS 10 Corral, but I, I swear there was something out there. If you've got that, bring it forward. Um, regarding the uh, Joy and VPC project, um, 
the work was never finished, it's dead and it will not be revised as is because uh, it is very invasive. It basically yep. uh, redefine what it means to be an M buff completely. So it changes everything and then it touches every networking code in the kernel basically uh, so that they can uh, efficiently pre and prepend headers and have chains of them. So yeah, it would be a good idea to go in the direction, but I don't think the code base itself is uh, that useful. Uh, it is an interesting study in how to design a good API for automation. But other than that, yeah, it's the Big Bang style uh, software development where you have a before and after and uh, not likely to get upstream if someone does it the same way, even if they finish it. Understood. And a quick, to uh, do, 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 do a quick update on Doug's 9P work, uh, he is going to rebase that and get back to us, but that is quite exciting. But uh, DCH declared it acceptable some time ago. Uh, here's a topic for us. There was a notion of FreeNAS 10 guest tools and uh, Beehive has never gone too wild on a notion of guest tools or compatibility with QEMU guest tools. So I'm curious, does anyone have a kind of wish list there of what you um, might want to achieve or obtain from guest tools? The thing is that the interaction, the basic interaction, as far as I can tell, between the QEMO user, uh, guest agent and QEMO happens over a VIT.io console, which Beehive already supports. So if you name a VIT.io console, the canonical name for uh, QMO um, user agents, they should just attach to that. And then it's up to someone to write the host side user space parts of it. Which would give us, for example, the uh, slow but easy to use way to access the file system and stuff like this. Because it's a simple JSON RPC interface, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, the most reasonable way, approach I can think of would be to just act as if we are QEMO and then uh, write uh, as the QEMO host agent for Beehive. And what are the top three abilities from such a thing? Like to what communication do you want? So, um, setting time, telling it to synchronize, sync to disk, or what else? One of the things which gets interest more in important with uh, snapshotting um, is that you can basically tell it to be ready for a snapshot or the other way around. I think even the guest can use it to request to be snapshotted. That I absolutely could use. And um, so this is probably a at least the protocol is fairly simple. So maybe we should just start with a protocol <laughs> if anyone wants to work on that. Right. Uh, Rodney, based on your VMware experience, do you have a top three abilities from a, a guest tools? Um, I, I mean, the common ones that are in that are used in the VMware tools are clock synchronization, ACPI, um, power events. Um, I think you have to have the VMware tools stuff installed to handle the ACPI hot plug, add and remove of CPUs, memory, disks, all of that stuff. I think that's going to need a a tooling between the guest and the host to to handle some of those types of events. I think a lot of this has been migrated into ACPI. So we may pick some of it up 
for free with UEFI type stuff, but I still think we need some way to to signal the event from the host to the ACPI handler. But those are the common things I see with VMware and, and VMware tools. So one of the things you can do through the uh, guest agent is, uh, if a guest agent is running, the host can reach into the guest and, for example, use the guest agent to read or write files. Uh, Instruct the guest to suspend itself. If allowed, you can even set the initial password or stuff like this. Yeah. Cool. And you mentioned the uh, QMU agent. Is that a little running daemon? Is it it's a, a little interface daemon, or which, what? It's a little daemon. Uh, you started. It's even available as a FreeBSD port already. For if you run uh, FreeBSD as a guest under uh, QEMO. Mm -hmm. but, and then it will look for the canonical uh, path where it expects a virtual server port or a virtual console port via VitIO console. If it finds it, it attaches, and yeah, then it waits for commands from the host. Or maybe it will, it can work in both directions, I think. So that the so, guest can also request features of the host. But. So it sounds like we have the console, we have the agent, we just don't have a beehive listener or... We don't have the yeah, server cool. side, basically. Okay. We have a transport in the form of VidIO console. We have uh, the agent in the form of a port. We don't have anything for the agent to talk to. Got it. Uh, is that simply a user space yes. program or is it deeply embedded in QEMU? It's a user space uh, Service, it has to connect to the Unix stream socket for the VidIO port. Uh, so, yeah, for VidIO console port. Is that hypothetically a portable piece of GPL software that could sit in ports where well, we just hijack the. A bunch of stuff it does is uh, fairly specific to the hypervisor or the operating there. system. So, no doubt. And I would just look if we can find a specification for the RPC uh, methods and look at what's worth implementing, what's worth. Is it a good idea to just reuse it or do, does someone want to reinvent the wheel? Okay. Uh, oh, right. I forgot about OpenVM tools, the replacement for VMware's proprietary tools. Uh, very good. Uh, note open. I'd for completely forgotten about those. Okay. Anything else? Just ideas relating to that? It seems to be a week for uh, new ideas across the board now that a lot of dust has settled. If not completely orthogonally, I see Jan, your your WireGuard scripts did make it to a review. Uh, the number is in there for what it's worth. Uh, I could sure use that, but it, it sounds like there's some architectural questions debating with other uh, contributors. It's a giant RC script. The question is how to best integrate it. It works as is. You can just take take it and run it, it works. Okay. Um, you can also use WireGuard without any of it and just not have a nice little wrapper around it. It works as is. It's just that you have to split the configuration up into basically the per node private key uh, and then the peers and the other interface configuration like MTU, uh, IP addresses, routes, and so on. Then you basically treat it like any other kind of tunnel without any special integration. 
Got it. So, and all of it works. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that I wanted to be able to basically drop a, a small wire guard quick configuration in and for it to work out of the box. Um, yeah, except for. Okay. And to that point, uh, late last night, Antrenig and I looked at the WireGuard documentation for BSD, and there's not a, a single meaningful mention on the wiki. So we might just blast in our observations um, there. A lot of it is on the WireGuard side of the development. So mm -hmm. the WireGuard was ported out of tree and then imported. So yep. there used to be a WireGuard KMOD Git repository under the, on the official uh, WireGuard project Git server. And then their mailing lists were used for a bunch of stuff. Okay. I thank you for that and Godspeed with that. I thank you also for the list of QEMU guest agent commands. So you can use it for initial provisioning, for example. Mm -hmm. And some of them are just informational, get info, get file system info. I like yes. that. Yes, time zone. Okay. Get OS info. Simple. Yeah, this is, this is good. Okay. Whew. I don't even know if the uh, um, part of the QMO guest agent to FreeBSD supports all of them. Okay, cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is fascinating. And I may as well go open here. So, uh, here is a link for open VMware tools. I'll just throw it in there for completeness. Any other topics, questions, ideas, issues, puns to add to the list? Is anyone running Home Assistant under Beehive? I am. Any Home Assistant users out there? I used to run it in a jail. I found that running in a jail involved too much overhead to get it to work and not all of the required things ran. Sorry, not all of the features ran. Specifically, I think it was adding it was add-ons or something that comes in from the kind of plugin manager like for things which aren't just uh, integrations um, only works on their bespoke quite insane uh, appliance image which uses docker compose for everything yep and i think that's what i'm using i think i'm running Hats, which is a home assistant operating system, something like that. But it, it just installed and ran very easily and has been pretty solid ever since under Beehive. Yeah, dropping it into and, Beehive shouldn't cause any problems. Um, and I, I run it um, on a ZFS data set, which means I can just use uh, Sanoid and Syncoid to snapshot it and send an image over to another host where it's sitting there as a backup. Okay, that's all from me. Cool. Um, that said, Evo, you've got a question and we did touch on yep. clustering in a recent call such that, uh, and uh, my general just disclaimer is, well, every client I know and user wants a cluster. They also want a pony. And it raises questions like, okay, so you're saying your application can never sustain downtime ever. That might be something to revise, uh, to, to review and explore because, well, the cluster may just uh, reveal that problem as opposed to solve it. Yeah. And yes, we all want to update hosts and not disrupt anybody. But 
Uh, but, but, but in the context of Daniel producing a, a, a ZFS replication tool, Zelta, we've been discussing how step one, it would sure be nice to have multiple hosts cross synchronize. And when you know that a written property is zero, you know, the guest is uh, fully in theory, if it's shut down, it's snapshotted, it's zero written and it's replicated. It is quiesced and ready to go such that if you can authoritatively keep that all under control, it may not be a true live awesome clustering, but it might give you 90% of the benefits and a whole lot of more safety. Because when I looked at, uh, say, Gluster with a bunch of colleagues, the recovery was a terrifying notion and reintegrating a, a, a node was never very clean. And so uh, uh, that topic's been coming up. Do check the most recent calls but I would love to see the storage comprehensively handled in a cross-node notion prior to looking at, say, a proprietary -ish sharding external storage backend. And then um, I do know, say, VStack and Vitali, who's been on and off the calls, has been really pushing to get the Saber store finished such that uh, looking at it from a ZFS perspective is kind of inherent to all this. And hopefully we get save, restore, even if it's a very brief uh, outage of the guest, possibly with a suspend. I don't know. This Actually, just this week, I was curious. Are there use cases where one would want to suspend a guest to disk, transfer it over, and wake it back up, assuming you can keep certain resources happy? Uh, the whole notion of a synchronized arc um, being handed over to another machine, I think is awesome on paper, but I don't know what that looks like in practice. Go ahead, John. Uh, so uh, basically suspending the guest to disk in the form of a snapshotting a running guest, um, and then moving the snapshot to a almost perfectly identical other host and recreating, uh, basically reinitializing it there is, the it's basically live migration with a few milliseconds to seconds of downtime. What do you so think you will that would notice preserve open connections and audio stuff? server? You will so let's say you run a Jitsi server inside there. Mm -hmm. If you do the snapshot, uh, move over snapshot, resume snapshot somewhere else, you will notice the stream dropping for a few. In that case, probably seconds until I have a client recovered. But uh, at least you preserve the running guest state. And if the network protocols aren't too uh, picky about short interruptions, it will just continue to work. But what doesn't work is the near lossless low jitter uh, live migration and yeah maybe i can a little bit articulate my Please. questions the the thing is that um for my use case so far it's not really about having the cluster as a cluster it's more about being able to see the the whole resources yeah as a whole so someone can say okay i don't know i have a, a three node cluster right and uh, using the UI in this case, it's possible to see a little bit what's the the overall usage of the uh, of the cluster. Did I this out? Is... Sorry, uh, you just cut out. I will... yeah. At least for me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was a three node cluster, and see the overall uh, yes. resources usage. Interesting. This is this is definitely something that I I noticed that people like to see. Um, it's not about moving the VMs around or stuff like that too much because I mean this is also not it makes not too much sense in my opinion. Also, it's better to load balance the tra the incoming traffic in some way. Uh, but having the the way the the um, the availability to be able to see what are the resources and adapt a little bit, this would be eventually interesting. So it's almost fleet management, uh, yeah, and. 
I'll just throw out one little thing. It was amazing when briefly FreeNAS had net data, which is a whole bunch of pretty graphs that made like managers really happy, even if they didn't understand them. And I totally see how aggregating that information and, you know, planning what, what moves would be good, regardless of the underlying technology for a move. Um, what have you seen on other platforms that get that right? Um, vSAN tools, otherwise, Kubernetes tools, who gets this right? Oh, well, mm, Proxmox does it right a little bit in this sense, because, uh, for example, we run a, a dislocated three-node Proxmox cluster for our internal staff and also our development machines. They are interconnected using WireGuard, uh, and they are also quite distant because one is in Asia, two are in Europe. So there's a small hardware, nothing big, really small stuff. But it's uh, easy to see a little bit what are the resources, how they are used, and I think this can help in the uh, in the production environments also. For Kubernetes, for example, we rely completely on the Prometheus uh, stack for seeing the different clusters aggregating the data into Grafana. I can imagine that something can can be done also probably for FreeBSD nodes. For example, we monitor also some FreeBSD nodes using Grafana where, and the um, node exporter, this kind of thing. So this is, this is quite easy to do. Um, maybe the solution would be to set up a Grafana dashboard just for having the overall situation. This can be probably done quite easily. And maybe the tools are already there. Maybe they just need to be used, right? Yeah, and Jan possibly snarkily said, hey, just package install net data, enable and launch it and go. And uh, it's a good start with existing tools. Uh, Dan, were you using Grafana or other monitoring tools, be it uh, LibreNMS, or is that a false memory? I'm using LibreNMS. Ride that mic. Ride that mic. We can't hear you. <laughs> Way over here. I am using LibreNMS, but it uses RDD. Yeah, we, we also use LibreNMS. Beside CheckMK, we use Grafana, LibreNMS, and CheckMK to cover a little yeah. bit of everything. So, uh, Tell us more about CheckMK. I have not heard CheckMK. of that one. Yeah, it's it's uh, basically a based uh, devolution of Nagios, if you can call it a little bit like that. It's called Czech MK. Yeah, it's a German company. Um, they have different versions, and uh, we use the free version. It, I have to admit, it's very good because the agent uh, runs um, on all kind of operating systems. Uh, it's really really well done. Uh, you just have to install the agent. You can also monitor using SNMP. Of course, and we cover with CheckMK. We can cover the monitoring of FreeBSD nodes. Of course, uh, all kind of Linux machines. We monitor OpenBSD machines. We can monitor everything that supports SNMP. Of course, um, Kubernetes can be integrated. And the nice thing about CheckMK is that it allows to use satellites. This means that I can install a central CheckMK node somewhere, right? And then uh, some additional uh, satellites, uh, maybe in remote locations or near to the customer's resources. And so the central check MK just communicates with the satellites. And so we have a little bit of distributed uh, monitoring system. Uh, LibreNMS has a similar thing, which is called distribu distributed polars, but it's not really the same stuff. So... CheckMK in, in our real life experience was basically the solution that scaled inside different networks that go deeply also uh, into the, I don't know, data center where the customer has its stuff and we can aggregate all this together. Ah, uh, sounds like you're doing quite well as is. And who had the distributed polars? Was that uh, Nagios it's or LibreNMS? LibreNMS has this distributed right. powers, which can be exploited in some way to do a similar thing. Um, but I read about it that it's not intended to be used like this. It's for different stuff. But right. I don't want to say something that I don't really know to uh, in a correct way. So I cannot speak about it. 
Cool. And I'm seeing the Check MK business trial, 30 days free. But let, uh, would it be the raw edition? That the raw is? edition is the okay, free cool. one. It's completely I'll free. I'll drop a link there. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Uh, to, to, let's see. By the way, the agent runs on different operating system, also FreeBSD, the server, the Check MK server. This one runs on, we deploy it on Debian. So, it's not possible what yet to happened. run it on on FreeBSD, the, the server part, I mean. Got it. Ah, interesting. Okay. There's a Docker. There's an appliance. Okay. Are you running the appliance on, on was it? No, no. I just oh. run the, uh, I, I take, usually I take a Debian VM and install it using apt-get and that's it. Okay, uh, cool. And with Ansible, of course, we can automate this. So we there's a, a really good um, Ansible role that uh, those guys uh, maintain. And uh, you can basically do everything with Ansible. So this really just works. It's really well done. Okay. Well, in your sort of cluster vision, it sounds like you've got some of the key plumbing in place, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> we try to... <laughs> Cool. And feel free to share that wisdom in whatever forms it takes. Any questions for Evo about that? That's quite cool. Okay. Well, I am never against a relatively short call. We're at 45 minutes. Antrenag, have you saved the day on the HBA? <laughs> <clears throat> He's unmuting. Oh, I am I'm currently backing up data because I don't know what will happen when I change the devices. God knows. This is super micro land with it's, it's the Cisco servers. So, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. No. Um uh no, it's 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 not cleared. And they, they did not allow us to have our own HBA core. They they wanted something that they manufactured themselves. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm waiting for that. I'll be getting it tomorrow. Um, and uh, currently, I'm just moving data to another machine. It's pretty problematic because it's I, I have like around a hundred terabyte of data, so I'm getting like what fifteen hours on a ten gig connection, uh, almost you know on the calculation. So uh, yeah, um, hopefully I'll have good views by the next week. Uh, that all of this works. Everything came down to the uh, controller being not happy, as far as we can tell. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I'll be documenting as I go. Uh, I'm guessing five years from now, these machines will be comparatively cheaper. So, sounds good. Well, anything else at this time, everybody? Uh, maybe I can add one thing that I was thinking about to implement. Um, as far as I told that we use Ansible quite extensively, um, basically, um, we also use it to deploy jails using Bastille, right? So I wrote some Ansible code to automatically be able to define um, uh, jails with Bastille. They will be created, they will be set up, and so on. The same thing could be done eventually for... Beehive, I didn't take a look so far if there is any Ansible code already around in the Ansible community for handling Beehive. But this could definitely be something worth to take a look at because uh, being able to centralize uh, the creation of new VMs using Ansible in, in a remote way and also having then the code, of course, in Git um, this this would be quite quite interesting to uh, to do. Um, also to follow a little bit the GitOps perspective, right? So starting to have this kind of things in code, people can review it. Um, we do this already for for jails, so it's only a matter of adding uh, more of that. Um, I I created a, a a tool for that for my own needs, which which is called Flamelet. It's on GitHub. It's basically um, a wrapper around Ansible. Where uh, I rule can... number one, drop your links. Be ready with your links. So go ahead and drop that in chat if it's convenient. Ah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Share the um, wisdom aggressively. Go ahead. Um, give me a second. I yep. have to of course. find it. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you there, but always have those like hair trigger. <laughs> One second. So what I what I do with the thing is basically that um um, I define different tenants, so uh, different customers are different um, different tenants, and with these tenants, basically, I can uh, have different roles and different playbooks that I define for 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 them. And I just run Flamelet. It will install itself. It will download the roles that it are required that are set for these uh, tenants. So. All the automation, also setting up, um, setting up. Um, here's the link. Setting up all the Ansible um, system with uh, different Python environments to handle different Ansible versions. All this is automated, and we really use it extensively, especially for legacy situations where we need to set up. Um, VMs, uh, jails, this kinds of things. I need to work on the documentation of that. I hadn't too much time. So this tool is really, um, yeah, we, we wrote it for ourselves and it's what we use every day. So it starts to uh, to become better and better. Um, I'm waiting a little bit to push it uh, to the public in the sense to involve other people. But uh, yeah, probably I need to write some documentation or make, make some short videos to show how to use it. Um, but uh, it's definitely, it really helps much to do the daily DevOps job with different tenants or customers. And yeah, that's the story about that. So it's one of those tools that have been written because it was a need for ourselves. Yeah. Oh, Jan, I know you've you've cranked out quite a bit of Ansible and S6 to run VMs. Uh, I might even be able to find that link if, you haven't, but I think you might find that interesting. Yes, uh, I do use Ansible uh, to provision Beehive, but the problem with it is that it's very bespoke to my setup. A bunch of stuff is hard; it's not mo modular, and it does things you shouldn't do in Ginger templating. You shouldn't have to do relational algebra in uh, Jinja loops. <laughs> uh, so, just, are you willing to share that repo? I know it was what, the Bremen CCC? Uh, the, oh. Yeah, the, I shared just the table of it with you, I think. I thought I found a Git repo. I could be wrong, but I, I swear I found something. Anyway. I think that's something else. Okay, got it. Ah, uh, cool. So, yeah, to answer your question, an, uh, there are now, indeed a few things out there. I have another there. topic. Yeah. Mm, please. Because um, I did look at my uh, Beehive S6RC stuff again, and now I have an idea how to do the bottom layer of it. The question is, uh, how do I want it to look from the top down? So basically, how does should the user interface look like? And uh, question especially how do I model it correctly so that it's close enough to the um, real data model that there isn't a lot of interaction, abstraction, and lies needed, but still um, user friendly, so that you don't basically have to do everything just the same way through another layer of interactions. <laughs> And the idea would be something like you have templates, they create instances of types, and then you have types for bridges, disks, interfaces, URTs, VMs, and you can basically instantiate a template. It does its thing. You can destroy an instance. You can enable or disable instances. You can set a bunch of properties on them. And then you can basically attach instances of different types to each other, like attach an interface to a VM or a normal interface to a bridge, so a disk to a VM, a UR to a VM, and then you can start it up. In a useful way. 
And And yeah. would that mesh into any existing tools like the Super V hack, or is that just No, a new vision that would for be this? the so, something like that would be the back end to make sure that the VMs stay up. around and get restarted when they reboot or crash. But this would basically be the indirection on top of that, so that you have a nice interface for a single host. Cool. And if you do everything in far too much shell scripting, you can just drop in your templates and they can do arbitrary shell, shell things, which is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, understood. Well, And keep us my posted question on is that basically, vision. how do I model that so that it's useful as an abstraction, but still close to what really happens so that I don't have to track too much um, state, which isn't real, but only state for the user interface. And is that related to your previous state tracking ideas? I know Yeah. at one Uh, point yes. it was like file descriptors. And how's that coming along? With what? You had Uh, one model, you threw out the model, you had a new one. <laughs> the... Oh yeah, that uh, work is um, yeah. One, I'm having fun for time to really work on that, Understood. but the sign is there. Uh, Anything else? Well, everybody, I am happy to call it. If you're good, I am going to stick around for a little bit. Um, and I thank you. Uh, on the things like the hackathon, it, it was a mere four hours and quite productive. But uh, do you feel that should just be maybe monthly, periodic, randomly? I'm, I'm easy. Maybe propose a monthly one if there are topics, basically. It only happens when someone brings a topic. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're blessed with perennial topics like documentation and you name it. No, It's as in, like I have a topic I want to work on. I want to have a productive community around me to do it. Not uh, there is a to-do list of things someone else should be working on. But... Okay. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I wish you a great remainder of the week, and perhaps I'll catch some of you next week. Like and subscribe.